Cherubs, thank you for joining me once again. We're, we're dealing with people who are wrong on the interwebs. It's not Nick that's wrong, I suspect, in this one, by the way. This is me reacting to Nick, reacting to the very arrogant, the very ignorant, the very erroneous Peter Attia um, on something that Peter said about low-carbohydrate diets or something at some point. So let's hear what Nick has to say. And for the best of both worlds, I'll add in the stuff that Nick possibly might like to say something similar to. I don't know. But even if he did want to, he wouldn't be able to because of his professional situation, uh, a restraint under which I no longer have to labor being fully self-employed and permanently retired from academia. I can say what I want. And I'm going to. So uh, for those of you who are up for that or down for that, whichever it may be, all good. Buckle up for safety, motherfuckers. Here we go. If you're watching this, you almost certainly know about Oreo versus Staten and that. Yes, N equals one. So of no value to anybody, Nicholas, except yourself as a publication and possibly as a conversation starter. Uh, but this is a conversation that's been going on already for decades. So you're not actually adding really anything much there either. You're doing some other great work, by the way, I hope. In this field. Right, what's next? That's gone relatively viral. We've gotten millions of views and watches across YouTube and podcasts. Had okay, so there's the benefit. Fair enough. But you're a scientist, Nick. Maybe you're diversifying and becoming a shock jock. It'd be awesome if I could teach you how to swear properly. I'm looking forward to completing your training. And be a bit more angry about things. It'll happen in its own time as you age, if you continue to try and do things in academia. Um, oh, you'll see. Had multiple interviews. News articles are dropping left and right. It's been quite an exciting time. In that maelstrom, a lot of people have been DMing me clips from old podcasts, particularly one, a conversation between Dave Feldman, my colleague, and the man who came up with the lipid energy model and lean mass hyperresponders in the first place, and Dr. Peter Atia. Now, I don't tend to like to air dirty laundry or dig up things from the past. So this was a podcast back in 2018. I think it was episode 19. I'll link it below. Because people are allowed to, you know, change their ideas and what now, six years is a long time. So I want to caveat what's about Funny you should say that, Nick, because in the last six years, my ideas around human nutrition, health science in general, and cardiovascular pathophysiology, my areas of expertise, those views haven't changed. Statistics and statistical inference too, I suppose. I forgot that as an expertise. No change in my ideas in six years. Do you know why that is, Nick? It's because my ideas, as they are now formulated, are the result of decades of formulation and destruction testing, such that my arguments are now unassailable. How do we know that what I'm saying is correct and they are unassailable? Well, it's because people therefore feel their only tool is to go ad hom and have a crack at the man instead of playing the ball, which tells me that I have won. So anyway, that's for another day. What to happen, which is me reacting to a little bit of conversation with the statement, I'm not trying to shame anybody. However, this is a really important conversation, lean mass hyper responders and lipid energy models that I think we all need to be having as a scientific and medical community. And Peter has a massive voice. He, he also has a massive ego, um, a massive destitute failure of understanding of his own place in the grand scheme of things, academia, science, that kind of stuff. Um, and he's a bloke with very loud opinions, which are often demonstrably false opinions. Uh, and as such, I find Peter Attia to be a criminal misanthropist. Anyway, whatever. He is someone that, quite frankly, I think he should talk with Dave again or talk with me about the evolving science. I think what he should actually do is to shut up 
is even in recent times, and you can see my past reaction video, I think there's been mischaracterization of the work that we're doing, the claims that are being made. And so this is just a little snippet. I'll react to it and then um, leave the door open to response by Peter and colleagues so we can have an evolved discussion that hopefully can move the conversation forward. So with that, let me it's very adult, Nick. play. This is the timestamp around three hours and six minutes in the, oh, Jesus. the podcast. <clears throat> The question is, how does it alter our understanding and thinking of the problem? Look, the whole reason I'm even pursuing this particular strata is because of the model in the first place. I had to have something that I could conceive of that would inform the decision by which I would be looking for what the data is that would disprove it. That's why I'm in pursuit of disproving it. At the end of the day, Peter, I, I can't emphasize this enough. I'm not looking to talk to the echo chamber or looking to just maneuver around inside of a, num a number of people that are going to congratulate me. I specifically... But I specifically, think you're better off going to an NLA meeting than... I want to pause and just reflect on what Dave said there. He's trying to disprove a lipid energy model, the observations were being made. That's how science works. That's how it should work. A lot of the time, people are looking for confirmation bias, but a good scientist will take the model and really try to smash it. And quite honestly, maybe I have a biased perspective, but I would pat our whole team on the back for doing a really good job of doing that in the first place. I think we can use Oreo versus statin as an example. You know, if you take your model and you want to kind of break it, break it with a hammer, Oreo versus statin is like getting a, a rhino high on cocaine and like shooting it at the model and seeing if it breaks. The, I yeah, but Nick, N equals one self-experimentation is hypothesis forming. It should never unless there is something absolutely earth-shattering in the finding, it should never be published. It should be the thing that drives you to get a cohort together and do the study with statistical power. What you've done instead, I get why you've done it, I understand, and I've seen what you've pointed out there in terms of the results, in terms of publicity. Worth its weight in gold for that. Absolutely worth its weight in gold for that. And congratulations, Nick. But as a scientific thing, ooh, nasty taste in the mouth. N equals one. Are you stoned? We know you're not. But you get the point, I hope. Idea that, you know, for me it was I announced that I was going to do this, didn't know if it would work, but thought it would work. And we see where the data landed you know, half a year later. And the data are what the data are. If you haven't seen that video abstract, definitely check it out because this conversation needs some context. But that aside, I think in general, we've been trying really hard to break the model and speak across the aisle. I've contacted Peter. I've contacted, well, I mean, plant chompers, Walter Willett. Ooh. Mr. Epidoodly Moodly Mology. <laughs> Good luck having a logical discussion with that clown. Willing to that boy doesn't understand the difference between causation and association, demonstrably. To speak with people outside the low-carb community, in fact, those are the conversations we really want to have. However, in order for that to happen, the onus is on you know the hosts to have us on and platform us be willing to have the discussions. It's really impossible, or at least unfair, to expect us to speak across the aisle when the other side of the aisle doesn't want to speak with us. That continue and then a low carb meeting sure but they're freaking expensive i've looked at all of them <laughs> i got the low carb community to fund you if they want to know the answer because i don't think they do if i'm going to be brutally honest i think the worst of that crowd just want their confirmation bias they have seen these incredible benefits of low carbohydrate diets and their belief is nothing can be wrong with this like we somehow live in a monodimensional monochromatic world where like it's that black and white and if the diet is good for this, it can't be bad for anything. And they are so wed to that, that they, they construct these crazy arguments. But if they share your passion for- No, you just did, Peter. It's called straw manning. You're suggesting that your opponents or antithesists have suggested something that they have not suggested, in fact. And then you attack that argument that they didn't offer you straw man okay for truth then they should happily fund you to go to an nla meeting and spend a week there and and actually start i'll pause it there for a few comments one his challenge to dave to get the low carb community to fund him 
Well, I think Dave picked up that gauntlet pretty well, having now started a grassroots movement that funded the trial that's going on at the Lundquist Institute, looking at lean mass hyperresponders and plaque progression. Plus, he has gone to many NLA meetings. Now, the second portion by Peter, when he's calling on the low-carb community and basically calling them out as uh, monochromatic thinkers, I think is the way he put it, thinking in just black and white. I'm going to call a little bit of hypocrisy there on a few fronts. One is that, quite honestly, Peter, I think you've been a monochromatic thinker on some of these topics that have now been evolving. This wasn't just like one esoteric blog at this point in 2024. We've had, you know, 10 or so papers on the topic and really trying to distinguish different etiologies, different causes of high LDL cholesterol. And yes, but that's begging the question fallacy, Nick, because who cares? why the cholesterol is at the level it's at, as controlled pretty much entirely by that person's genes reacting to the situation in which those genes find themselves at this time, with the evil machination of best subserving the whole need to maintain that person's homeostasis. Those genes having successfully achieved this task now for probably something like 13 or so billion years. So why on earth would we give a rat's rear end what the level of cholesterol in the blood might be at any given time? why high LDL in a lean mass hyperresponder context is very, very different than FH, which you seem to continually conflate. So this was a video I did over a month ago in response to you and Derek in your conversation and saying, look, you have some good points, which I line up, but it's completely inappropriate to conflate these different causes of high APOB, high LDL, FH. And also still has no actual clinical significance or meaning because we are still apparently laboring under the illusion, the falsehood, that any of the lipoproteins or any subfraction of the lipoproteins or any of the things carried by the lipoproteins are causally involved in heart disease, which they are not. How's that? <laughs> and lean mass hyperresponders, they're distinct and you don't seem to want to separate them. So you can go see that other video if you want. But the bottom line is like in the one FH, you have a congestion. Yeah, but um, also, Nick, Peter Attia couldn't distinguish the difference between his anal orifice and his elbow if I labeled both of those and taught him how to read. The boy is singularly one of the least well-educated commentators claiming to be a well-educated commentator in many various fields that I have come across, as it turns out. Genital disorder with a broken metabolism, yes, you can say it's a phenotypic diagnosis with a genotypic etiology, but the basis is you have a broken lipid metabolism, this is congenital, and there aren't things like in lean mass hyperresponders where we see the inverse relationship to BMI, that it's inducible with carbohydrate restriction and reversible with carbohydrate reintroduction, even Oreos. Bottom line, these are distinct etiologies, distinct phenotypes. You can't just look at the LDL and call them the same or then conclude from that high LDL that they're at the same level of risk. You cannot conclude anything about anybody's risk of anything from the extant data, Nick, thus hitherto published. There is no cause and effect data extant, ergo, the claim of risk, which is absolutely necessarily a cause and effect claim, is null and void. No. Points off. Report after class, Nicholas, for dusters. Right. Let's carry on. We need to ask those questions. They're beyond the boundary of our current knowledge base. So it's monochromatic. So is clearly the difference between association and causality in a wider field than I thought possible, Nick. All right. Need I say more? Not impressed. Black and white to say high LDL is high LDL is high LDL, because quite honestly, we don't... And who is to say what's high LDL? Under what logical premise? Whoops. 
the foundation stone is soft and crumbly. All right. You don't know that. So continuing. Hanging with these guys who are way smarter than me. Yeah. Like I'm a knucklehead. Yeah. I mean, I know a lot about lipids for a knucklehead, but you really apparently don't, Peter. I'm talking about like the smartest people in the world are the ones you need. Yeah, but you've just admitted how lacking you are in that respect, Peter. So how could you possibly therefore make a statement about who the most intelligent people are? Does that make sense logically? Okay, so your your opinions, Peter, are of very, very low value to anyone except those with a pretty like low IQ, it seems. Opinions are like anal orifices, Peter. Almost everybody has one. Mostly they're full of shit. All right? You need to be talking to on this topic. And they're not at low-carb conferences. I promise you that. Yeah, but therefore the, the people that you think are the smartest, they're therefore, by definition of what you've just said, clearly aren't. Because the smartest people in the world go to all the conferences. They know what everybody's up to. They're not on Twitter, and they're not playing patty cake. Some of them, the really, truly most intelligent ones, the ones actually doing good for humanity, etc. some of them are on Twitter. Quite a few of them. Takes on their, like, high-carb or whatever low-carb blogs. Like, it's just not about that stuff, man. And again, I mean, I think what you're doing is really interesting. I don't agree with the model, but... I think that was... Yeah, but Peter, why would you think yourself qualified to talk about the model. And if you're going to say the model's no good, why don't you provide some logic underpinning that statement? It was a little bit condescending. I'll leave you to make your own conclusions. Well, condescension isn't necessarily a bad thing, Nicholas. See what I did there? <laughs> condescension is sometimes warranted. Like when young men who are just starting a burgeoning, scientifically successful publishing career, do things like conflate association with causation and publish N equals one papers. Regardless of this was in 2018, just as condescending. And yeah, well, again, so what? I think inappropriate call. Is, is that like a, I don't know, is it something with your generation, Nick? where your offense puts you in the right and the other person in the wrong somehow. You don't have the right not to be offended, Nicholas. You're putting yourself out there, you're fair game, and people will take cracks at you. All you need to do is be prepared to robustly defend your position in terms of its logical construction, make yourself unassailable, and get a bit more bloody belligerent, frankly. Because you're too polite, in my opinion. Right, what's next? All plus, easily fall. They'll eat you alive, Nicholas, is what I'm saying. If you don't harden up a bit. Falsifiable. I mean, William Cromwell, who is the senior author on Oreo versus Statins, trained Thomas Dayspring, who trained Peter Atia, and he's coming to COSI in March, the conference that Dave is running. Okay, so name dropping. You can't just blanket say the smartest people in lipids aren't at these meetings. That's just a jerk thing to say. I'm sorry. You're concluding based on somebody's dietary preferences, their intelligence. That's a little bit... Not well, I'm quite happy that that's probably indicated in some respects. Like those individuals who for some reason feel that it's a good idea to become a card-carrying member of the Church of Anorexia Vegana. To me, that speaks to a person's intelligence. I'm sorry. Again, with the offense thing, I don't care. Knuckleheady, as you call yourself. I will say, he goes on to say, we should speak to these people. We have. I reached out to Peter when... I yeah, I had a great discussion with a vegan recently myself. Reaching out, I was. You all saw what happened. I wanted to write the Journal of Clinical Lipidology report, and he very nicely declined, saying that he wasn't an expert on this and that I should talk to someone like Ronald Krauss. We talked to him. Now he's senior author on that. Point being, talking about these experts, Cromwell, Krauss, Anatole Kantush, they're now joining in the conversation with interest around lean mass hyperresponders and the lip energy model. So my question to you, Peter, now speaking directly to you, 
why haven't you expressed interest? Because he's a buffhead, an over-opinionated, arrogant, ill-educated buffhead. So I'm going to leave it there. Again, I'm a little bit pokey, punchy, but that's because this is evolving quickly. We'll Am I helping? soon have a dozen papers on this topic. We have pretty compelling data, including... No, 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 no. Nicholas, no. No. That is an unacceptable bit of verbiage there. Nobody compels me to have any opinion on any topic. I read the data for myself, and I decide whether that data supports any conclusion that it might have been offered. All right? Get that out of your lexicon. In a recent meta-analysis of 41 randomized controlled trials... Spe you, you mean pseudo-controlled sort of a bit and, you know... Headed by our good friend... Ad You've got to be honest, Nick, about what is possible in human research. Such that it is human research, teehee. Ethics committees will not allow science to be done on human beings, Nick. You know it. I know it. Let's stop talking as if science has magical powers to inform on things when we're not even following its disciplines because it's not ethical, it's not practical, it would cost too much, etc. Okay? Be realistic with the non scientific public about what we've got here. Please. Adrian Sotomoto, MD, PhD, in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Like, that's not low level data. It's an meta of RCTs. And yes, I'm doing things like Oreo versus Statin because what that does is give me a platform to speak to you and to speak to the community. It seems. Those that want to see my reaction to that meta analysis, it's already on my channel, available for your viewing pleasure be working and i am at some level throwing down the gauntlet and say let's have an evolved conversation i think you'll find me pretty reasonable I, I think overly so nick as, as i've been alluding to i'm not going to say hi appleby is fine i'm why not there is no evidence to the contrary you're speculating I'm not going to say ketogenic diets cure everything and there's no problem with them i don't that would be a better contraindicated statement I believe that. I actually probably can come to a pretty decent center and agree with statements that you make, like it's part of the LDL, ApoB is part of the causal cascade. It's no. no. There is no evidence to support that claim, Nicholas. None at all. The word you just used was causal. That requires a certain kind of data set collected in a certain way under certain disciplines, put together some two and a half thousand years ago. You and I both know that data does not exist. That is an absolutely unacceptable statement, Nicholas. Necessary but not sufficient. And what do we do with the information we have and the tools we have? The tools including now, you know, a wide buffet of... It's neither necessary nor sufficient of drugs, including, in addition, lifestyle modifications. And how do we wrap context around individual patients to treat with appropriate clinical caution, and then at the same time pursue more research that we can then use to, again, inform decisions of real people. So those are my words. I hope you actually respond to this. I realize you're a busy man, but I think this is important, and I hope you agree. All right. Thanks, Nick, for that. Um, yeah. Not really much to add, but I haven't already made quite clear and patent in terms of my reading of what's going on there. Um, we do have to understand that Nicholas does have to behave in a certain manner due to his continued involvement in academia. There isn't an expected code of behavior and conduct. Um, so not really a, a surprise that he didn't climb into Peter, as it was absolutely indicated that he should. Um, but what concerns me more, Nicholas, is some of these other issues that I think you and I better have a heart-to-heart -heart about at some point. Association versus causation. It's fundamental. You should have learned this in the first half an hour of your first undergraduate degree. Why has it now slipped? Okay. Right. 
the rest of you, you know what to do. Don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way out. Clean up this briefing room, etc. Uh, Master Chief Burgess, make sure you have the list of latecomers for dusters and things. And the rest of you can report to Yellow Ted for your next assignment. Until next time, catch you around.